web seminar. Okay. Um, so this is work I've done in collaboration with Alexander Monin, David Perskalab, and Fiona Siebold, who is a student, and uh, which came out a few months ago. And uh, we are pursuing the same subject with a bunch of other people, Gabriel Cuomo, Anto de la Fuente, Alexander, and David. And uh, but the work in progress is not mature enough. I'll only make some comments about it. So let me so let me tell you what the goal is and the, and the stage. So we're considering a CFT, a general CFT with some global symmetry, some global internal symmetry G, uh, endowed with some Cartan subalgebra with Cartan charges I call QI. And in this situation, I want to consider the lowest dimension operator uh, labeled by a set of charges, QI. Okay. Uh, now, the claim and, uh, and the goal is to get the consequences of this claim is that for the, the case in which the charges are very, very large, one can compute by semi classical methods and with all the, the compute goes in quotation mark uh, whenever, it, well, you will be able to compute with some. Uh, find a number of input parameters, some set of input parameters that will become clear in, um, in the course of the computation. What you want to compute is the following quantity uh, that I indicate here. Do, do you see my pointer? Oh, this is my pointer. Uh, so, um, so I want to compute the, a, a correlator with two insertions of this operator of large charge. The operator with large charge and the operator with the, 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 the complex conjugate one with opposite charges, and insert in the middle a, a number of operator of small charge and also small dimension. Uh, the basic picture that, uh, that, uh, that, that emerges is that this computation uh, can be mapped, can be, can, can be made equivalent to the computation of the correlators of uh, a set of sources of small energy and small charge uh, in, a, in a superfluid state of the CFT characterized by large charge density, associated with, uh, by the operator state correspondence, the action, the state that is generated by the action of this operator on the vacuum. Now, this idea uh, was first put forward by Hellerman, Orlando, Effort, and Watanabe about two years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, Simeon gave a very nice talk at the Bootstrap meeting in 2015 at Weizmann. Uh, my, our work is, can be viewed as, a, on one hand, as a, I don't want to say clarification, a, a derivation of the result of element collaborators with a slightly different perspective, I would say broader, uh, I don't want to say deeper, perhaps broader, and, uh, and also to derive some extension of, of, uh, to, to, to develop it further. Okay, So th this is what I'm going to do. I'm kind of worried that when I ask, do you hear me, nobody said anything, but everybody has the microphone turned off, I believe. OK, so let me start with a little joke, which is totally not needed, but since I have it in the end, let me make it, uh, is the three great leaps. If I had to um, synthesize the progress of physics since the very early days, I would do it this way in one page. I would do it this way. Uh, statics, mechanics, and quantum mechanics. First, there was Archimedes, who invented statics, which amounts essentially to finding the stationary points of the potential. Archimedes could do that, but could not tell what happens when the system is not at the precise equilibrium, how it evolves with time. For that, we had to develop mechanics. It came much later. And there again, the, that was characterized by a stationarization, a stationarization of the action. Uh, but with the discovery of, so you, you, you go from the potential, V, 
the Lagrangian, so an object which contains also the potential, but contains also more stuff. And then the next step is quantum mechanics. You use not just the stationary point of the action, but you use, say, the hell with just the stationary point, you use all the action, and you superimpose and you do it. And there are superposition states. And uh, of course, this is the progress of physics, but that doesn't mean that in, in, in specific physical situations, we may go backwards and use the, the intuition of the, of the founding fathers, sometimes Lagrange, sometimes Archimedes. And we know very well that that is the case in quantum mechanics when we are in a situation where we have a large number of quanta, if you want, when the action is large, in which case we can go back to describe more system, consistently with the semi classical method. And the case of large charge that I want to focus on is precisely one of these. Okay. So, of course, the goal is to focus on, on the CFTs, but to illustrate the basic idea, I think it makes sense to focus on a very simple and well known toy example, which contains essentially all uh, the features of the basically all the features of the CFT examples that we we'll discuss later on, and that is the case of the fast spinning uh, rigid rotor. Okay. In other words, this is particle living on a sphere whose Hamiltonian is just given by the angle of momentum squared divided by the momentum, moment of inertia. Of course, you can solve exactly the system. Okay. The eigenstates are, are given by spherical harmonics, and the energy level are given by this. Now, in this, for this uh, system, which we can solve exactly, we know it very well, I want to uh, test the semi-classical approach. And, and to do that, I, will, I want to focus on the subspace of states with given uh, J3, J3 equal M. Okay? Given a, a certain M, the subspace is infinite, okay? it contains states of arbitrary L. In fact, all states with L bigger or equal than M in this infinite subspace of the Hilbert space, there will be a ground state, a state of minimal energy, which is the state with L equal M. This ground state has, therefore, energy equal M times M plus 1. Now, I want to study the properties of the state using the path integral and semi-classical methods in the case where M is large. To do so, I just consider uh, the most general state with fixed uh, angular momentum J3 equal M, by projecting uh, state theta phi uh, on, uh, in the following way, right? Just uh, project, just form state which have, which have uh, given angular momentum J3 and arbitrary theta, okay? So I can then consider, so these are the states that, that characterize our subspace J3 equal M. So, for the states, I can consider now the path integral, okay, the Euclidean path integral. Okay. Uh, the Euclidean path integral in the states can be written in the following way. Okay, it's, a, it's an unconstrained path integral with the addition of this term, okay, which when integrated over time, uh, projects on states of given angular momentum. When integrated over time, this, and you integrate over the initial and final phi, this precisely does the projection that we have. Of course, the action, the, the Lagrangian is just the standard action of the rigid rotor. Now, in the limit where the time stretch goes to infinity, uh, this path integral is dominated by the ground state, okay? And, uh, and this, just consider this path integral a large time stretch is one way to compute the energy of the ground state. Now, uh, in this path integral, there is a large, when, when M is large, there is a large parameter and uh, turns out that in this case, expectedly, okay, when M is large, you can compute uh, systematically this path integral using the other point approximation and uh, all corrections around it. Okay. So how does this work? Okay, what are the basic features of this computation? First of all, the stationary trajectory. Uh, the stationary trajectory in Euclidean space has this form. Uh, it essentially, it is the Euclidean version of a particle spinning on the equator. It's clear that if you fix angular momentum, the lowest 
energy is given by a particle, classically is given by a particle that spins around the equator. If you have the particle spin in, on, on some other circle, in order to have the same angular momentum along J3, it should spin faster, so you should have bigger energy. So this is, and this is the stationary trajectory that, that you obtain by minimizing the action along the form. So the other important point about uh, this, this stationary trajectory is the symmetry, it, its symmetry properties. The symmetries will play a crucial role in the later discussion. Now, this is a system that is endowed with full rotational invariance and time translation invariance. Now, however, the stationary trajectory, as all classical, non trivial classical trajectories, uh, breaks a bunch of these symmetries, breaks this overall symmetry to a subgroup. In the present case, SO3 is fully broken, and uh, time translations are also broken, and the only thing that survives is a linear combination of time translation, Hamiltonian, and rotation in J3 direction. In other words, uh, if you both rotate in the J3 direction and time translate, this solution remains invariant. That's just the stationarity of this solution. Okay. And, and uh, uh, so the time, the generator of unbroken time translations in this case is the linear combination of the Hamiltonian and a, glo and a global charge. And the coefficient is what normally is called chemical potential, just standard notation. Uh, the excitations in this case, uh, are, there are two types of excitation, phi and theta. Now, it turns out that uh, in the original, original non-spinning uh, case, in, in, in the limit where there's no spin, these are both Goldstone bosons associated with SO3 broken to SO2. These are just, I mean, the, the rigid rotor is a sigma model, per se. However, when you, when you spin, uh, also, also J3 is broken. So, uh, so the symmetry is fully broken, and and also space and symmetry is broken. Time translation are broken. So you you are in a situation where Boston theorem works in a different way, and what happens in this case is that you don't have a number of goals that is precisely given the number of broken generators, but it's in generally a smaller one. In fact, in this case, the only genuine Boston boson is phi, okay, which is the one associated with the only generator that commutes with the effective Hamiltonian. And this mode has, in fact, frequency zero. On the other hand, the fluctuations in the theta directions are gap, and they are gap precisely by the chemical potential. That's a known phenomenon in, in symmetry breaking uh, situation where you also break space time symmetries. In particular, when you have some charge, finite charge, there are goldstones whose mass, or if you want to, whose gap, because you don't have low length, Picking, is controlled by the chemical potential. Uh, I spoke about symmetry breaking, although this is quantum mechanics, so genuine there's no real symmetry breaking, we have not in field theory. And uh, it's just that the semi classical, I mean, the, the, the classical trajectory that I'm expanding around breaks symmetries. At the end of the day, I still have a, an overall integration constant, which is phi zero, and integrating over that, I restore full symmetry. So now, in this situation, you can compute uh, physical quantities, in particular, the energy of the ground state. And you can show that easily that it is an expansion, that the, the, the loop expansion is controlled by the inverse of, of m, our charge. And if you do the computation, the result has this form, the three level, there's the one loop. The one loop is, a, is just, you can just view the one loop as the, uh, ground state energy of the theta oscillator. As I said, the theta degree of freedom is gapped, and its ground state energy is precisely this. Uh, of course, uh, if, if you do a computation at, at two loops, you have a finite constant contribution. Generically, when you regulate, you also have an infinite but constant. Okay. Uh, and now you can go to higher and higher orders. Of course, we know the result. We know that the result is the exact result is given by m times m plus one. So all the higher orders beyond three loops should cancel. Okay. Uh, we check explicitly that this happens indeed at three loop. It's not totally trivial to check it uh, because full rotational invariance, uh, since you have to regulate the path integral, if you don't choose a good regulator, 
you subtly break the symmetry. And to preserve the symmetry, in this case, you have to use dimensional regularization. And dimensional regularization, in this case, we go to one plus epsilon, has some subtlety. And anyway, it took us some time to go over the subtleties and at the end, check that indeed you get this result. So at the end, the result is precisely what you expect, okay? Uh, is the well-known result plus a, an additive concept just due to the fact that we have an impact integral, so there's always an additive concept that we cannot control. And of course, in this situation, we can also control the excited levels around this ground state simply by now computing systematically correlators, okay, using the path integral of operators built with these fine theta uh, fields, okay, and then by cutting these correlators, by, by separating tau one, tau two, tau, tau n by, by, by large distances, we would get information about all the intermediate state, their energy, and also the, the matrix elements. Now, I want to now uh, extend the situation, oh, no, before extend the situation to quantum field theory, let me, let me just say that there is, you could also consider, uh, which is relevant for what I will have to say later, a more general case, the general case of the fast spinning particle in the potential. Of course, it should be a potential that grows with R, otherwise the particle spins away to infinity, okay? So in this case, the linear trajectory is again uh, on the equator, if you fix J3, and it will be at some fixed value of the radius as a function, which is a function in general of M. Uh, the softer, the, the tougher the potential, the slower this R grows with M. So the, the, the soft rotator has, uh, will have some M dependence. Again, theta will be uh, fixing you on the equator and you will have an effective uh, moment of inertia depends on that. Now, what is important about this more general case is that, again, you have two classes of excitations. The gap excitation, which involve, which are in particular the radial mode and the theta mode, they are essentially, unless you have uh, big numbers in the potential, they are kept around the same scale, which is controlled by precisely the chemical potential, or what would be the chemical potential, okay? which is the velocity of fire. And while fire remains a genuine Boltzmann process. So, so you have you have gap Boltzmanns and model dependent modes that are generically at the same scale, and then you have a robust mode phi, which is exactly my same. Scale. Now, in the case at hand, in the case of quantum mechanics, the interesting physics is coming, if you want, fortunately or unfortunately, from the gap modes, and it is model dependent. The the physics of the robust mode, the, the mode whose masslessness is robust and also whose Lagrangian is pretty much constrained. Phi does not have a very interesting dynamics in quantum mechanics. Now, in the case of, of QFT or of CFT that we will see, we'll have a similar situation. However, in field theory, in particular field theory on the cylinder, the, the analogs of phi have a more interesting dynamics. And it is the interesting dynamics of this mode that buys us mileage and allows us to say interesting things. So let me now go to the, to the case I want to consider, which is the case of the CFT. So what I'm doing, I'm going to translate the case I just illustrated, where I have a particle, angular momentum, and states with given angular momentum and other quantum numbers to the theta angle, the radius, and now go to a CFT, okay, where I have now some internal global charge, which could be a billion on a billion, okay, but let's for the moment think of an abelian charge, uh, to which I associate states in the CFT characterized by eigenvalues of the charge and whatever other quantum numbers you can imagine. Now, consider now the CFT on the cylinder, okay, if you're on the CFT in radial quantization, I can now consider uh, uh, correlators where I have placed in the in state, as the in state, a state of fixed charge. In other words, the in and the out states are the states that live in the in the subspace of fixed charge Q, okay? So this is precisely the analog of what I was doing with the rigid rotor where I was fixing M uh, and then I had arbitrary theta, right? Okay? Now, this, this situation uh, by, by the state operator correspondence by mapping to the plane corresponds to the situation where I inserted at the origin and at infinity respectively an operator of charge Q and an operator of charge minus Q. Okay, now 
Uh, and then, of course, I can insert all in the intermediate points, other operators of smaller chart, very much like I was saying. For the moment, I don't insert any. So now, in, in this situation, when I send the time stretch to infinity, uh, I will project on the ground state in this uh, subspace of, with fixed charge. I indicate the subspace this way, I mean, this ground state this way, and also the corresponding operator, I call it. O of Q. Okay. Um, so again, as I say here, okay, in this, in this, uh, if I fix uh, the charge of my asymptotic state, okay, in and out, then for large time stretch, uh, the the Hamiltonian evolution of the cylinder, which is just given by the dilatation operator, the Hamiltonian of the cylinder, uh, singles out. The energy of this state, or if you want the dimension of the state. Okay. So essentially, this is if I can compute this part integral, I have information about the energy, I mean, the, the dimension of the operator of lowest dimension and fixed charge Q. Now, very much like in the case of the rigid rotor, I expect that for very large values, when this charge is much, much, much bigger than the smallest quantum of charge. I expect this trajectory uh, is dominated by a saddle point. I mean, this path integral, sorry. This path integral is dominated by a saddle point trajectory, phi classic. Now, what can we say about this trajectory? Well, as I will now, I now want to argue, this trajectory uh, corresponds to some condensed matter phase of our CFT on the cylinder. Why so? Well, this is a, I mean, this is a trajectory which is endowed with a certain charge density, rho, which is given by the total charge Q divided by the surface of, um, of the sphere of the cylinder. Okay. Um, so Q over R to the minus one. Now, in the theory without any other small parameter, uh, without any, any big or small parameter, this charge density is respectively associated with a scale, scale given by the chemical potential, uh, scaled by the suitable power, mu to the minus one. So if the Q is large, I'm in a situation where the scale associated with the chemical potential is much, much bigger than the, the radius of, uh, of my system. In other words, I have an infrared scale, which is the radius of compactification. And which is much, much larger than the microscopic scale that describes my, my, my finite density system. So in other words, I have a situation where I have a separation of scales, where the scales, the mu that describes my, my, the phase of my system is much, much bigger than before. And whenever I have a, I have a separation of scales, I expect, I, 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 I may uh, have handle to come up with an EFT description, as long as the system turns out to be weakly coupled at the, at the lower end of the scale, okay? So if you want, uh, we're gonna end up in a situation uh, where mu is essentially like lambda QCD, and one over R is our infrared scale, which could be like the pion mass, or the, if the pions are massed, the scale at which you do the experiment. So these are, in this situation, uh, um, if we have reason to argue that the theory in the thread is only derivatively coupled, then we have a margin of computability. Okay? We, we can compute quantities in the derivative expansion. Uh, so, so what we have is a state with a, is a, it has a huge charge density. And uh, so well, we call this condensed matter phase. Now, uh, now this, very much like in the case of the rigid rotor, uh, this state, the, 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 sorry, this, this, this configuration that uh, minimizes, uh, the, the, the dominates the, the path integral, necessarily nonlinear realizes part of the, of the symmetry group of our system, which is just a conformal group and U1 rotations. Okay. And let me argue, and, and by considering how, how this solution nonlinear realizes the symmetry group, we can get a hint of how to describe it, okay? So we just, we're trying, I'm trying to reverse engineer what 
the symmetry properties of phi classical are. Okay, so how, how do we get that? So let me consider the action of the symmetry. So, so what do we have? We have a situation where we have inserted at the origin, which I call x in. You should think that, the, that this x in is the plane equivalent of our uh, in uh, insertion, okay, the, the, the insertion of the operator of charge Q at early time. When, when this goes at very early time, this goes to the origin, okay? So x in goes to the origin, x out goes, goes to infinity. So we have an insertion at the origin, so and the, the origin is not invariant under translation, so translations will have to be nonlinearly realized by the solution. Of course, the, the system has the symmetry, but the solution around which we are expanding does not have it because the boundary conditions correspond to the insertion at the origin. Similarly, uh, we have an insertion at infinity, and k mu is the inverse translation, is the translation of the point of infinity, of the inverse of the point of infinity. So also, special conformal transformation will have to be smoothed. What about rotations? Okay, rotations on the on the on the plane, or if you rotation on the sphere on the cylinder. Well, uh, the insertion at the origin at infinity are invariant. Okay, so they certainly don't break the symmetry. And now, if you if you add the hypothesis, which is an hypothesis, although it's reasonable, it's reasonable under just under the inspiration of experience, that the ground state is a scalar, in other words, that carries no angular momentum, then the symmetry will be unbroken. Now, the fact that the ground state of condensed matter systems satisfy the maximal possible Euclidean symmetry, which in this case is rotations on the sphere, uh, it's hard to deny. Of course, there may be a situation where this is not the case, but I think this is a fair assumption. But at this stage, and Throughout the, the study, this is an assumption. Okay. Of course, it's a self-consistent assumption, as perhaps I will have a chance to, to point out. <clears throat> now, what about the remaining two generators, dilations, which is the Hamiltonian on the cylinder and charge rotation? Okay. Well, this stationary, this trajectory the, 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 um, that minimizes uh, the action. Um, corresponds to an energy ground state. So it will have to be stationary, very much like the solution in the case of the rigid rotor was stationary. However, the generator of time translation that realizes stationarity doesn't necessarily have to be the rigid Hamiltonian. In fact, if you think of the rigid rotor example we showed before, that's very clear, right? And the only candidate so in, in, if you're in the general case, if you're the most general option is that the generator of effective time translation, in other words, the object which is leaving the solution invariant, is going to be a linear combination of the cylinder Hamiltonian D and the, the charge. Okay? Okay. So and the coefficient that describes this, this linearity is, again, as the interpretation of chemical potential. Now, a situation where, oh, damn it. A situation where, where the original symmetry, which is the conformal group time U1, is broken to rotations time, effective time translation of this form, is what defines a homogeneous conformal superfluid state. In fact, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Condensed matter systems like solids and fluids can be viewed, and a simple, a simple account of that has been, for instance, illustrated in this paper I wrote two years ago. Uh, homogeneous and isotropic states, uh, condensed matter states, are states that not linearly realize some space time symmetries, okay? So they can be fully characterized. Uh, in terms of their pattern of symmetry breaking. When you break a symmetry, uh, you have some, you are forced to have some Gaussian bosons, okay? Uh, in the case of space and symmetry, things are a bit more subtle, but also in that case, you do have uh, Gaussian bosons. In the case of condensed matter systems like fluids, solids, or superfluids, 
These Boston bosons are nothing but the, the necessary hydrodynamic modes of these states, okay? like phonons in solids, uh, sound waves in, in fluids, or super sound waves in, in, uh, in superfluids. Okay? And in the case at hand, this pattern of symmetry breaking is, is precisely the pattern of symmetry breaking that I just outlined uh, as the simplest and most, in the sense, the most general option precisely corresponds to this. Now, in a more general situation, uh, where you have a general group G, uh, what you expect uh, for the case in which you have a state characterized by a uh, large uh, value of all the Cartan charges of the group is that the symmetry breaking, you can argue that on general ground, the symmetry breaking pattern is given by this. You bring down the conformal times G to rotations time an effective time translation operator, which is a, just a linear combination of, uh, of D uh, and the Cartan charges with individual chemical potential for each of them. Now, in this situation, in general, you can characterize the excitations around the semi-classical solution in two classes. On one hand, there are the necessary Goldstone bosons, okay? There are the Goldstone bosons associated with the Cartan generators, and there are the Goldstone bosons associated with all the other generators. And then there are whatever other modes, uh, if you want, radial modes. And I'm using here notation, which is reminiscent of what I did before with the rigid rotor. There's the phi, there's the theta associated with the other non abelian generators, and then there are the radial modes. Now, it turns out that very much like it happens for the rigid rotor, you can argue on general grounds that uh, the, the non abelian goldstones are gapped. If you want, the main reason for that, if you, want, you can see that they are different than the phi i, is because for these guys, the generators to which they are associated that not, does not commute with the effective atom. Okay? While for the phi i, because they are in the Cartan, the, the generators, the Cartan subalgebra, uh, it commutes. So now, so now these guys, and of course the radial modes, are in general gapped and model dependent. Uh, on the other hand, the phi i uh, have to be massless, okay? And there's no way they cannot be massless, okay? And they are the angle of the phi in the, of the rigid rotor. Now, their dynamics uh, is, 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 universal, okay? And in the case at hand, it's also non-trivial because we have a non-trivial uh, manifold and there are effects at the compactification scale uh, which, which are not present in the analog quantum mechanical case. So the dynamics of these guys is richer than in the case of, of, of our simplifying quantum mechanics. And essentially all that we will have to say concerning these models. I should add that, okay, so this, so what, what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to study the more general system under the assumption that the only light states are the phi i. That doesn't mean that this is the more general case. There, there may exist specific cases where there are additional modes. Okay? Uh, for instance, supersymmetry may dictate the presence of other modes. It may dictate the presence of, a, a, of an additional radial mode that is light because it's a flat direction. Uh, there may even be, although I must admit, among the many things I don't understand this one, Sort of don't understand. There may exist uh, fermions. Maybe that the, the the condensed matter phase where you end up with is a, is a Fermi liquid. Uh, in which case, my understanding is that the primary degrees of freedom are fermions, and essentially the phi i are not I want to say bound state by but by linear form with these fermions. I have a hard time understanding this case with the language of universal. Uh, universality and symmetry breaking. So uh, I have little to add about it. Although in the general, from the point of view of assumptions, all that I am assuming here is that the, I'm, I'm just going to assume that there is, that the, the, the lightings of freedom are the minimal one that are dictated by goals of the that is to signify I. Now, in this situation, I, I as I said, I, I just want to zoom on the dynamics of the states, 
And uh, I don't know whether this is clear at this stage, probably it is not. As I argued, for large charge, uh, there's going to be a, an intrinsic local scale so with the chemical potential on, on the sphere, OK? And this scale is much bigger than 1 over r, OK? And uh, so expectedly, this is the scale that is controlling the validity of the effective description with Goldstone boson. Eventually, these Goldstone bosons are derivative, will be derivatively coupled. And only at scales, there's only one relevant scale that is mu that controls the interaction. And only, I expect that only at energies less than mu, I can, I can, uh, I can treat them consistently with coupling. Now, um, so an expansion of the inverse powers of, of mu is an expansion of the inverse powers of the charge. And that's very much what we were finding, again, for the rigid rotor, that we had inverse powers of n. So we're going to end up in the same case. Now, here I'm talking about energies on the cylinder, but energies times r should be interpreted here as differences in dimension. Okay? So we, we can essentially control, with this methodology, states whose dimension differs from the dimension of the ground state by an amount which is much less than the charge to this power, where these the dimension is based. So very much like in the case of the rigid rotor, this path integral at fixed charge will be written as a path integral where I introduce some uh, linear term, linear in the, in the, in the charge and the velocity. This, by this, this, this linear term essentially enforces the boundary condition of fixed charge at initial and final time. And stationarizes will give us some, will, will, will fix the solution. Now, how do we proceed in this case? We build the effective Lagrangian via, via the standard cosette construction, which is the one we use to build, for instance, the pi Lagrangian. We find the stationary trajectory and then compute whatever we want to com we can compute in the derivative expansion, which, as I said, is an expansion of the inverse powers of the charge. Now, Probably I should skip this part uh, because I'm, I'm not going to say much about it. So, uh, so now I, 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 I would need at this stage to say something about the, this general cosette construction, which was first uh, introduced in, in, in particle physics by Callum and Coleman and Wesson in the 60s to describe the pi Lagrangian. Uh, the idea is very, is, is fully geometrical. And uh, so, how will this speed up? Uh, so let me just quickly say, uh, you start with, uh, so you parameterize, so you have a, cer a certain pattern of symmetry breaking, G over H. You can parameterize, so you know that you have some set of Gaussian bosons associated to the broken generator, pi i, t i. And uh, you parameterize your cosset manifold with omega a representative of the cosset. And you build the Lagrangian using the following objects. You consider this, this differential form, the compound form, and which contains two things, contains the D and the E symbols. And the E symbols are objects that transform in the joint of the broken group. And they essentially transform, they transform as gauge fields for a local H, while the DI transform as some in principle, reducible representation of H, of local H. And then the rule to build the effective Lagrangian is to write the most general object involving D, the, the D symbols and the covariant derivatives and involving derivatives of them, okay? In such a way that you have, uh, um, and the rule to build them is to enforce local H invariance. Local H invariance of this construction ensures global G invariance. Now, the very fact that the object you build the Lagrangian have derivatives uh, tells you that your Lagrangian is built ab initio by a, in terms of a derivative expansion. Okay? You have terms that have more and more derivatives in, divided by the fundamental scale of your, of, of your system, which in case of QCD is not QCD. And this structure is at the basis of all the soft pine theorems of QCD. Now, another important thing of this construction is that you can use the Goldstone bosons to, if you want to compute matrix element operators in the low energy description, you just saturate them using goes to boxes. Okay? So you can match UV operators in a real representation of G using the uh, description terms of Gaussian boxes. Now, in the case of space-time symmetries, things are more involved. 
a Boson theorem is more subtle. You have, uh, first of all, the number of Boson is typically uh, less than the number of broken generators. Okay, and this phenomenon is associated to what is known as this inverse X constraint, which is just a relative of the fact that you can uh, gauge Poincare consistently by having the, the, the spin connection be a function of the of the field plane. Uh, now, aside of all these in principle complications, the, the interesting cases are described very simply. Take, for instance, the simplest possible case, which is a relativistic superfluid corresponding to the breaking of Poincare times U1 charge to the Euclidean group, namely rotations and translations, and this effective Hamilton. Now, this system is fully described by this Lagrangian. Okay, Lagrangian with the field phi that shifts under the, the charge symmetry and, and expanded around the solution where, where, um, where phi evolves in every time. Okay. And the excitation is just the hydrodynamic constant. In our case, things are made more complicated by the fact that we want to do this pattern of symmetry breaking not on flat space, but on the curved manifold and similar. And uh, well, I mean, we, we've invented a way to do that. It's a little bit, I, I don't want to say baroque. I wish we had a better way. We go through some local Poincare, then we build the gauge cassette, and then we eliminate redundant fields in freeze graph. At the end, you can check whether by this construction you do indeed realize the desired pattern symmetry breaking, although it's a little bit indirect way it's done. I wish we had a better way, and what should be done? So we started the following applications, okay? Uh, let me, let me I, I just really want to quickly go to them because this is, I believe, the interesting part of the talk, not what I've been saying so far, unfortunately. Okay, so let me just we, in principle, our methodology allows us to describe any group. <clears throat> I should say that our cosset cons general cosset construction, strictly speaking, for the simplest case, U1 is probably an overkill, and maybe even for U1 cos U1. But when you start going to more complicated non-abelian situation to study the most general uh, situation, then <clears throat> it really it, it's really hard to proceed without the systematic approach. Okay, so it has a value, although even though it's boring and complicated. So we consider these three cases, and I will only talk about the first two. I should say that the first one was already discussed by Simeon and collaborators. And let me just recall the results uh, here. So let me, in order to do that, let me focus on the case of three dimensions. Okay, so let me consider a three-dimensional CFT, which is, for instance, a U1 and SO2 model, okay, in three dimension. Uh, um, so in this case, uh, the pattern of symmetry breaking dictates that the simplest op the simplest possibility is that you get away with just one goes to field. Of course, you could have more degrees of freedom, but that but that would be special. Generically, everything else can be gapped. So if everything else can be gapped, let it be gapped, and let's have just this goes to field. The Lagrangian has the structure. Okay, it's <coughs> it's scale. It can of course, and conformal invariant, the leading term is, so it can be built using just this rough notation where indicated by d phi the square root of uh, the gradient, the, the norm of the gradient, which eventually will be of order the chemical potential. And so it's organized as a, as a series in powers of d phi, uh, uh, of, of d phi, where r is the curvature. Okay, so remember, eventually, the phi will be huge on the background because the phi uh, uh, is just the velocity of the field. The velocity of the field in this situation because like the chemical potential, larger density, large chemical potential, the phi is large. So, uh, so then I can organize my terms in the potential in the in the Lagrange in terms of powers of the phi. You see, the first term has three powers, the second has two. Uh, well, because I mean, I want to write something which is analytic in terms of the curvature, so I go down by two powers of derivatives, okay? And then, of course, I this is the this linear this combination of terms is what ensure not just scale but conformal full conformal invariance. And there are more and more terms involving more derivatives and more inverse powers of the phi. Of course, in this equation here, you see all the structure is non-analytic in the phi. 
you get the square root, you get inverse powers, but no problem because we're going to expand around the non trivial integral. And, and, and what happens, you see it by just by extending, I mean, just by fixing the charge. Fixing the charge means doing the path integral for this action with the addition of this term, uh, which is the analog of what we had in the rigid rotor, is what fixes uh, the charge of the boundary states. Okay. So then, by minimizing the action, uh, the, the full action with this term, we get the classical solution as this form, uh, where mu is, is obtained by, 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 by varying the Lagrange respect to, to mu itself, OK? And it has the following form, where you see that mu in, in units of, of the radius, which we could have taken to be 1, goes like the square root of the charge. Okay. This, this result, mu goes like the root of the charge, depends on the fact that we are in three dimensions. In other dimensionality, we would have had a different problem. And the higher the terms go down by inverse power of q. Okay. Now, remember, mu is square root of q, so d phi squared goes like mu squared, okay, d phi squared. And the expansion, this is an expansion, the Lagrangian is an expansion of d phi squared, so everything is going to be an expansion of inverse powers of q, because q, d, d phi squared goes like q. Okay? So, so the, and in particular, what you can compute, okay, immediately you can compute uh, the, 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 the energy of the ground state just by finding the solution and plugging back in the, in the Lagrangian, you get the, the, the energy of the, of the ground state in the following form. Again, it is written as a series, okay, where at each step you get by, by power of, uh, of uh, Q. Okay. And if you want, the fact that you go down by integer powers of Q is just a consequence of locality of our region. Now, OK, so the, the structure is, is just a consequence of, of locality. This applies to the local terms. However, quantum effects okay, do not uh, respect this locality, okay? do not have a local form. And in particular, uh, the leading quantum corrections don't. The leading quantum correction, you obtain them by just considering the quadratic uh, Lagrangian, the, 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 the perturbation, the quadratic perturbation of the solution okay? has this form. Okay? Notice that there's a one half here, there's no one, so this is not Lorentz invariant. Okay? The, 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 the speed of sound is one over square root of two. This is just the fact that this is just the analog of what we have in this dimension where in the approximately massless relativistic plasma, the speed of sound is almost square root of three. And it is just a consequence of conformal invariance. Right? Now, in, in this, for this case, you can compute the, the, the first quantum correction, okay, the, the, the determinant fluctuations together with that. And there's going to be some divergent parts which are normalized the local counter terms. But there is a calculable finite Casimir energy correction, that's a Q, which corresponds to a constant piece, which cannot be written as an integer power suppression of the leading term. Okay? So this is because it has no local counterpart. Now, this term is calculable, OK? And it's universal. While these coefficients here, C1 and C2, depend on our local Lagrangian and depend, if you want, on which CFT you're, you're, you're considering. You're just the, 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 these are just parameters that you cannot compute, okay? They are just peculiar, specific of the CFT. Uh, this correction here is universal, okay? All CFTs with a U1 in this situation have had this correction of this precise value, okay? Now, of course, as it's often the case when you do effective field theory, in order to tell this, to, to be able to single out this prediction, you need a pretty damn precise uh, handle on the dimensions. Okay, so in other words, when Q is large, this is a tiny correction to the dimension. Yet, if you have a precise way of computing or measuring, you can give you a prediction. It is the essence, precisely, of whenever you have, like the pi Lagrangian. Predictivity in such weakly coupled theories go along with uh, high precision in, in either computation or measurement. But now. However, we, the, the power of this description goes beyond uh, the computation of the ground state, because now we have 
we have the whole set of excitations of uh, around the solution okay and uh, we can quantize this excitation we have a fox space for them okay? in particular at the linearized level the pi field okay if you want this uh, this sound wave of the superfluid you can you can decompose it in in angular momentum modes okay in in, uh, in modes of given l and m because we are on the sphere we are the, our space is a two-dimensional sphere so the modes of this guy are characterized by creation of such an operator a ln a ln dagger with the energy given by by this uh, kinetic term this is just the angular momentum square of the sphere so this is one half of that okay so this is a, again this factor of two is just the the, the, the hallmark of conformal imbalance and it's very crucially so for a reason that you'll see in a moment now these operators were acting on our vacuum or if you want our state of minimal dimension at given chart we generate a set of new states which by the operator state Corresponded are said to other operators whose dimension is given by the original dimension times the number of quanta of a given type uh, times the frequency, uh, the, the, the energy of the certain quantum, at least at the leading order. Of course, then at higher order, there's going to be interaction effects, okay, because the Lagrangian is not only quadratic, there are terms, but, but at the leading order is what you have. And then, again, this interaction effect, you can compute the systematic, although we haven't done it. It would be interesting to do it. Now, uh, what about the properties of these states? Well, first of all, notice that for L equal one, omega, the energy increase that you get is precisely one. So the, the, the dimension is increased by one unit with the action of the spin one wave. Okay. In fact, you can check that these spin one waves are precisely given by K and P. There are three of them, okay, and they are precisely A is given by the special conformal transformation and a dagger is given by pm so the action of a dagger on our ground state is the action of pm on our ground state which is just of course the ground state is the primary operator so the action of a dagger will give us all the descendants of our uh, ground state operator okay while all the other uh, a and a a daggers with l different than one uh, which commute uh, with k, just by the quantization condition of this pi on the sphere, this will therefore generate genuine new spin primaries, okay? because uh, they will generate states where which is annihilated by k. Okay? The action of k, uh, as it is zero on the ground state, it will keep being zero in the other case. So there's a very non-trivial spectral information on 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 the non-trivial new spinning primaries that exist about the state. And this non-trivial information just comes from locality and symmetry. Okay? The locality of our superfluid description and the symmetry, that this non-linear symmetry that uh, drove us there, unavoidably, no matter how we, we start. Uh, now, it's interesting to consider the, the next complication, which is a system which has a U1 cross U1 symmetry, OK? Uh, so I want to consider a CFT, which has two independent U1s, and I want to consider the case, the states which have big charges for both Q1 and Q2. Now, uh, I don't want, again, the, the construction here is slightly more involved. And however, uh, there is immediately at the leading order in the derivative expansion, you see that you have a much richer, much richer situation. The point is that, you can take ratios if you want of the gradients of these goldstones. Okay, these are dimensionless, and uh, and you can check that if you take ratio of the gradients and the ratio uh, and the and the scalar products of the d phi one d phi two, these objects so constructed are perfectly conformally invariant. So you can write uh, a general function of that without putting any powers of the curvature. So in the limit where the chemical potential potentials are large, these quantities uh, scales like ratios of the chemical potential. They don't go like inverse. So this, in general, the leading description is controlled by a function rather than by some coefficient. So apparently, there is less universality. So you can write the thing in this form. It's convenient to write it this way, OK, to keep a sort of symmetry, although 
that shouldn't be necessarily seen between these, between these two lines. And the K-parameter is everything in terms of the uh, uh, geometric average of chemical potential and the ratio of the chemical potentials. Now, it turns out that by minimizing, uh, by, by finding the stationary condition, the stationary condition dictates that the ratio of chemical potential is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the ratio of charges, and why the, the average, the, the geometric average of the two charges is controlled by the, the overall chemical potential and the ratio. So, okay. So now in this situation, you can compute uh, the, 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 so essentially, if you want, if you fix the ratio of charges, if you go in a given direction in the space of charge, uh, and you only change the overall value of the charge, keeping the ratio fixed, you're, you're like in the previous situation, okay? However, when you change the direction, things change. And in fact, the, the energy of the ground state takes the following form, okay? It goes like the, average, the, the geometric average charge possessed as before, inverse powers. At each step, the derivative expansion you get one inverse power. However, the coefficients, unlike they are no longer uh, just numbers, but they are functions, okay? I should say that this description, okay, now here you have a much richer situation, and you can imagine that at some special points in, in the space of charge ratios, okay, at some particular direction in charge space, you may have phase transition associated to the fact that some of the massive modes can become massless. For instance, in the, in the region where one of the charges goes to zero, you can have partial symmetry restoration. So you can have a different description. Okay? In fact, you can argue that this phase transition can also happen just with something more that you can, you can, you can study, even without uh, Q1 or Q2 going to zero. Okay? So it's a more intricated situation, but certainly you expect to have patches of, of charge space where you have definite given description, and then patches separated by phase transitions. Now, what about uh, the computation in this case? Well, you can generalize it, okay? You, you will now have two, uh, at the quadratic level, you have two goals to excitation. One is the genuine hydrodynamic mode associated with broken translation barriers. And the other is a standard goal. Okay? And, uh, and we will see that this is the one whose spin one component uh, controls K and P, K and all the descendants, while this is, is just generating other primates. So again, you can compute the first quantum correction, okay? Again, it is calculable, but like everything in this case, is, there is an unknown coefficient, which is just a function of the speed of sound of the other goals, to, okay? which is a parameter which depends on, uh, on the ratio of charges, okay? Now, of course, you don't have the same sharp prediction as before, However, you have more quantities to compute. See, now the Fox space has more states because you have, you have not, not just the creation, you don't, you, you don't have just the states that are created by the action of pi plus, but also the other ones, okay? And now, basically, all these guys give you primary and their energy are controlled by, in one case, they are just fixed by symmetry, in the other case, are controlled by the speed of sound. Oh, there is a minus here, okay? Now, these are all primaries apart from the one corresponding to plus one, which is just the, the descendants of the, they just give you all the descendants. Now, final thing, uh, uh, you cannot just compute the spectrum, you can compute more properties of, uh, of this. In particular, you can compute correlators and fusion coefficients, okay, systematically. And let me just illustrate how this works, okay. So, so let me start with the analogy with QCD. So how do we do in QCD? Uh, in QCD, okay, we have, imagine we start with the UV description, we have quarks, imagine we have a bilinear sidebar psi made of quarks, quark with flavors A and B, okay? So this is an operator of, of, the, of our fundamental theory. Uh, we are interested, maybe interested in computing the matrix elements of this operator at, in the long, range description at energy below lambda QCD. Well, you know, how do we do that? Well, we map this operator to uh, the most general expression that saturates the same quantum numbers of this operator, and it's written purely in terms of Goldstone, because the Goldstone's 
are the quantum, the, the degrees of freedom of an energy theory. So we, 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 we match the chiral quantum numbers, and that is done this way, just by writing in terms of the Goldstone matrix. We match dimensionality, in this case, it's just lambda QCD, now there's a real dimensionful parameter lambda QCD. And of course, we could add uh, further expression which involve derivatives of the Goldstones, but these other expression at long distances will matter less because they will have more freedom. So in the end, at the, in, the long, in the long range, the matrix element of this guy are controlled by some coefficient which we cannot compute, which can maybe get from the lattice, but it's just uh, from the point of view of the energy effective theory, it's just an input, but everything else follows from symmetry. Now we can imagine doing the same thing in the CFT. Okay, imagine we have some operator of our CFT which is characterized by some small dimension delta, some small charge Q, and some angular momentum small L. Okay, this is like small perturbation. Okay. Now we imagine that uh, if you compute uh, matrix elements of, of this object, uh, this era, uh, will be uh, in the, they will be. Uh, uh, control, I mean, around, given that all the correlators are controlled by this semi classic expansion around this trajectory, this around this trajectory are, will, 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 will just be mapped to the, to the expression in terms of the Goldstone that saturates precisely the quantum numbers, original quantum numbers. So, just to give you an example, the simplest thing you can imagine the current. So, you, you have a, U, a global U1, you will have a current. So, how does this current map? In the, in the regime where we can use our effective description, where it's simply the neutral current of the description in terms of goals of yes, the S over the new phi. This, of course, is trivial. The same thing you can do for the energy quantum tensor. Okay, and that's, if you want, is the way we did it for KP before. But there are uh, other cases that are perhaps more interesting and less trivial. Take, for instance, an operator with dimension delta, charge Q, and spin zero. You can easily argue. You can easily argue that the the corresponding that, that this will map to an expression of, in terms of the Goldstone in, this, in the simple one case, which has the following form. Okay, it has the relevant power of the of the derivative of the Goldstone field to match the dimension. It has the relevant e to the iq phi to match the charge, and then it can have higher terms with higher derivative. Okay, higher the uh, curvature terms in charge. Suppressed in the long distance. Okay. So you can compute. So everything, in a sense, boils down to a coefficient here plus coefficient that control further refinement. So, so you can go ahead and compute. Uh, for instance, you can compute the following quantity. You can compute the three point function between, for this operator of small charge and small dimension between our vacuum okay, and a vacuum with the corresponding charge. Of course, the charges should match, otherwise this would be zero. Again, the reason why uh, charge conservation is enforced is, there is, is that around our solution, there remains a zero mode upon which we have to integrate, and integration of, upon this, on this zero mode enforces charge conservation. So essentially, what we want to compute is the following object. Now, in the limit, you can, you can see that this is discussed in our paper. I don't want to give you details, but I'm pretty straightforward. In the limit where Q is small, you can treat the insertion of this operator, you can cast it as a small perturbation of our original path integral. Okay? There's our original path integral where you, you make a small insertion of an operator, and at the leading order, you, what you simply compute, to compute this three-point function, you simply replace uh, our operator around the leading solution. At the next order, this operator spits out to go to an excitation and the collect them back, and then you go on, and then there are these three from three, and then there's an interaction. You can you can cast the 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 all this computation uh, as as a as a loop expansion. Of course, a three-point function is a pretty trivial object. This form is totally fixed by conformal invariance. The only interesting and genuine information is in the coefficient. Okay, how what is the value of the coefficient, which is just part of the CFT data. Now, anyway, it is reassuring, at least we have checked, that uh, the triviality, if you want, the conformal invariance is indeed satisfied. And amusingly, it is satisfied by the standard rule, by the standard property of the chemical potential. Okay? Remember, this three-point function will involve some powers of excess, 
with difference of, uh, of, uh, of dimensions. And, uh, and uh, in, in this methodology, the, the, the result matches what you would expect in the conformity theory, thanks to the fact that the difference of dimensions between the object with slightly bigger charge and the original one uh, is controlled precisely by the chemical potential. In other words, the, the difference of dimensionality is, is equal to the chemical potential times the amount of charge you add. So it's just controlled by how much it costs in energy new to add the charge Q. But the more interesting thing is that, you, you, and you can check it in this case, uh, and it's just a consequence of this matching here, okay, just matching the dimension, that the fusion coefficient scales with the definite power of the charge. Okay, in other words, you have that the, the, the this three point function between big charge, big charge, and small charge uh, scales like a power of the big charge scaled by the, the power, the, the, the dimensionality of the small charge times a coefficient, <clears throat> which you cannot compute. And of course, you can find that it's going to be both loops and higher. Uh, higher refinement of the operator matching will give you higher powers of one over Q. Uh, in fact, you can do this computation also in considering operators with spin. Okay, you can consider the three point function of our scalar ground state, and not a scalar operator of charge uh, Q in dimension delta, and an excited state with bo both more charge and some spin. And how do you do this? Well, this you can obtain it by considering. The four point function, okay, the four point function where you serve capital Q, small case Q, and then the opposite charges at, at, at four points, and then you decompose uh, in partial ways, trivially, by taking x2 and x1 very far apart, okay, and then you will have in this case that at leading order, you will have no, essentially, you, you again, you compute this diagrammatically, the leading order, you just replace the original solution. And this you, you have exactly the typical function. That, that means that the intermediate scale you have this scale, in, in the intermediate you have the scale I discussed before. But at the next order, uh, you can exchange uh, excitations of the Goldstones. Okay? And these excitations of the Goldstones carry all speeds. Okay? That are precisely this created by this A and the dagger uh, uh, um, excitations of the Goldstone. Okay? They involve genuine new primaries and descendants. Okay, and the interesting thing is that uh, the fusion coefficients for all these guys are controlled again by the same coefficient c that entered for the three point functions of uh, involving the scale. Okay, particularly you can compute and you find now that the behavior is this you have the same coefficient, unknown constant, uh, q to this power times an additional suppression by q, given that the fact that you had to pay the propagation of one additional quantum. Again, you have, you can predict lots and lots of, I mean, in this regime, there are uh, uh, all this uh, data which involve independent primaries, okay, uh, that are controlled just by one coefficient at leading order and have uh, a given scale. Uh, you can also consider, and this is basically the last comment I want to make, uh, now, in the, to, to study this, the, the composition in thin, uh, it's easier to take x2 and x1 far apart, but you can wonder what do you get when you take them close. In fact, a question you may ask is, can I see, the, can I see in this approach the short uh, distance OPE of x2 and x1? Can I, go, can I see that when x2 and x1 become very close, uh, the OPE of these two operators is dominated by the identity. Okay. Well, it turns out that you cannot. Okay, and then and let me explain this in what remains in the time that remains. I feel like lost in the back. I don't know if anyone is listening to me. Anyway, uh, so let me take the limit where where these two guys get very close. Okay, uh, for this correlator, uh, the U and V. Uh, Conformal ratios reduced to this. Okay, so the limit where the, the point get close is the limit where uh, u goes to one and v goes to zero. Okay, so you can in at the at the if you want at the next leading order which I showed before, which is where 
In principle, here we have no exchange of excitation. Here we exchange one excitation, and we can exchange more and do this. And, uh, and uh, the 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 F U V function, which if you want, controls the 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 four point function after after having stripped the trivial dependence on the on the coordinates, has the following form. Okay, and uh, what should I say here? Is that okay? This is saturated by the exchange of the scalar. Okay, the, the scalar that is in the OPE, the scalar that I first discussed, if you want the scalar vacuum of, of charge little q plus capital Q is controlled by this. And what you have here is the combined resummation of all summation of all the effects of descendants of this guy and genuine primaries. And the crucial thing here is to see uh, what is the expansion parameter, because then the same parameter will control the further terms. The expansion parameter is, is, a, is, is just this, okay? If you can just uh, look more in, in, in simple terms, is this object here. Essentially, what you have is that when x12 becomes sufficiently small, this expansion parameter becomes a order one, and all your perturbative. Uh, expansion, for example, it, which means this is just the indication that your effective weekly Hubble description is no longer tenable. You cannot treat, you cannot treat your, you cannot compute quantities at finite order in the exchange of this quantum. In other words, this quantum cannot be recovered. In other words, the perturbative expansion breaks down when these points get closer than one was from the Q. And if you want, this corresponds precisely to distances that are less than the inverse of the chemical potential. In the scene. So, so there's clearly no free lunch. Okay, on one hand you have this, uh, which is the usual property of uh, effective field description. They're powerful, but you are bound to 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 be able to use them only generically in the long distance region. So, in other words, if you want the region where the standard OPE dominated by the identity uh, works well, lies outside the domain of validity of large charge field description. So, in fact, you, you, you can just elaborate a little bit on this. I mean, it, in order to be in the regime where the insertion of these two guys is oblivious of everything else, of the existence of this charge, big charge far away, you have to get to very, very close distances. If you want, this large charge perturbs the insertion of these guys by a lot, unless these guys are very, very close, and they have to be as close as one of the script of Q in order to, for, to be able to forget about this attitude. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the result, I mean, and, and, and when they get very close, then, then, then eventually you can use this. If you want the result is intuitive in the superfluid picture, okay, a medium affects the propagation of quanta if they are a sufficient lo long distance where in, in such a way that sound waves dominate their interaction. Okay? At long distances, it's sound waves that dominate everything. Okay? It's only at short distances that this uh, quanta can, can, prop, can interact independent of, of, um, of uh, I mean, in a way that can be oblivious of the presence of this uh, macroscopic state. If you want, this is the same result if you want of particles. Uh, in, in hot QCD, okay, at very short distances, you can forget about the medium. But at long distances, you cannot describe particles. You have hydrodynamic modes, plasma, and everything else. And we are precisely about the So let me conclude. What next? Uh, uh, I've discussed three dimension. Uh, all this can be almost a four will be, be extended to, I mean, also discussed in two and four or six if you want. Uh, the only Thing you have to be careful about is that the, in those cases the effective action uh, also involves a term whose construction is slightly more involved. This is the West term, but this is again we know how to do that. In fact, talking about two dimension, it would be nice to compare to some exact two dimensional case. Uh, this is something that we wanted to do, and but we haven't, and uh, we plan to. It would be very nice. To, to be able to compare this result to some non-trivial case, okay? 
And uh, maybe somebody in the audience, in the silent audience, can point us toward that. Now, what about what perhaps is most, more interesting, the case of large spin? In fact, the case of large spin is, is, is basically the main reason why I got interested in this, because there was this hint, this, this, in fact, it was not hint, it's just a very clear indication by the analytic bootstrap, okay, derived by some distinguished members of your collaboration, that at large spin, even if you're not in ABS-CT, not, not in large end theory, uh, there is, I mean, there's clear signals that you may be able to, I mean, that, that you have a semi-classical picture. So we have tried, we have tried to think of how old this picture would be, uh, but we didn't make any definite progress, okay? One difficulty of the large spin case is that most likely, in fact, unavoidably, it would be a configuration that is not homogeneous, okay? Um, in fact, or, already in the analytic bootstrap, in, in, in the ADS picture, you had this uh, spinning gravitons, whatever, uh, okay? So it's not going to be a, a homogeneous configuration. You will have uh, some lumps or stuff. In fact, uh, um, so inspired by, by this, in fact, we have started looking instead at the large spin, large charge case, which, is, which seems more promising, okay? And this is the case where you have both a large charge density, so you have a superfluid, but you also have spin. So you want to have a spinning superfluid. But if you try to make a superfluid spin on a sphere, given that uh, the, 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 the flow is a gradient, okay? It cannot, okay? And the only way you can make it flow is if you, have, if you add singularities, if you add vortices. For instance, you add a vortex, not the vortex at the north and the south pole, okay? And, and uh, we have some plausible indication, okay? This is what we're working on right now, that the, the, the situation where the angular momentum is of the order of the charge is self-consistently described by a vortex and the vortex configuration. Well, in addition, to the superfluid modes, pi, you also have the vortex coordinates among your, your variables. In fact, this in the, in the two plus one case, this superfluid state is dual to a monopole configuration, and the vortices are just quantized charges in this monopole field. So the energy levels are on the levels. You can do a lot of studies. I think it's interesting. We'll see. I, it's all I have to say. All right, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? I, I have some questions. Yeah, go ahead, Slava. Uh, hi, hi, Ricardo, thanks for a nice talk. Oh. Sorry I was silent, but for most of the talk, I did not have any audio on, so I could not ask any questions. So I have a question uh, concerning this case of two I mean, there are many questions, but I only asked just one. So you have this situation with two U1 groups. Yes. In which you say there is a lot of, I mean, there is universality is not as, I mean, there's no full universality and, and so on. Well, and so okay. Let me ask a question. So two U1s, you had this arbitrary, well, here, yeah, that's, that's a good slide. So, but suppose that you, in fact, you have a non-abelian, Mm, theory and so that the charges so that the operators are organized in multiplets of the non-abelian group then we know that in fact operators for multiplets with different values of cartan so in fact you are supposed to be able to move within these multiplets somehow so in fact they have to be big i mean i'm not saying degeneracy but so in fact in I don't know how it's going to work out. I mean, how is this going to be consistent with the structure of non-abelian multiples, the structure that you described? Yeah, because, it, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you see, the case of a non-abelian group with two Cartan uh, generators, okay? Yeah. To eliminate the massive goals reduces basically to this one, okay? And because the, the, the other guys are, are gapped at mu, generically. 
So you're saying how you distinguish that from this? Yeah, I'm saying, okay, you cannot, you cannot compute it from effective theory, but perhaps you can impose this extra information post factum. Probably you can, you can do that when you want to, certainly you need to do that when you want to match operators and you want to write them in terms of Goldstones. Uh, then you, you, you will have to use this Goldstone to build G multiplex rather than U1 cross U1 multiplex. And there you will have more coefficients, more freedom. Probably there that you get more stuff. Uh, you see what I'm saying, perhaps. Um, but uh, but 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 I, I wouldn't know how to see right away. This, this perhaps my collaborators can answer right away, but they're not in this room. Is, is that the question, Slava? Yeah, yeah, that was the question. So. Um, so you're saying that I should see a bigger multiplicity in the non-abelian case than in the abelian case. Yeah, I was one. I mean, it seems to me that there's some story here, but perhaps we should discuss later on next week when I'm at CERN. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I haven't thought about it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I also have a question. I could imagine a situation in which the lowest energy state in the charge sector is not a scalar, but has some low spin, say it's a fermion. Could your setup be generalized to that case? Uh, if, it is a, if it is an object of small angular momentum, yeah. then I, you're basically saying that the ground state is a quantum object. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm afraid that this, you see, I wouldn't be able to describe this in classically, I'm afraid. You see, see, for instance, this I vortex case, I, but I'm going by analogy. We, you, you should go to this vortex case. It mm -hmm. may well be that our, that our case only has the vortex. I mean, in principle, I could imagine a situation where this is the ground state. Mm -hmm. but here, the angular momentum is huge. It's order Q. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I would be able to describe this. Uh, this uh, pure, this ground state with spin one half. I I see. I, I doubt I would be able, to, but but I don't have a definite. Uh, I see. My so feeling, I, I in zero. My, my spin. Quantum situation. Then. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just some small because you see any semi-classical, any potential semi-classical situation can be made non-semi-classical by the addition of some small quantum numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically, I'm assuming that this is the only quantum number I have. It's Q. Right. Uh, so for instance, I, um, so for instance, I could imagine that, uh, that uh, so let me say, I could imagine that some of these fields are, okay, become tachyon, one of the radial fields, some, some, some vector field. Okay, and then and then you have some condensation of some vector, and that breaks rotations. Okay, but this, as long as you describe this in the classic, the angular momentum associated with that is huge because it's yeah. it's a big expectation value, and uh, so I, I I I don't see this as I, I don't see this as coming from a semi-classical description. I see. Uh, I understand. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So I guess maybe I can ask one more quick question. So this, the in the U1 case, the um, order one correction can probably be tested in some large N expansion, presumably. Um, so the the zero point zero nine. Yes. Well, in that case, so if you have large n. Yeah. Now, now if you have large n, that means that these factor C's are are 
the, the, the C1 has to be large. So let me just go back. So mm -hmm. large N, now there is some weird, uh, there's a C2 there. I'm so I guess a, a, better, a better way of asking this is that, do you expect that there should be um, a problem with the order of limits if we have large N and large Q? No, having large N, uh, having large N just means that this C1 in front of everything is large. Mm -hmm. C1 are large. Now I'm slightly confused about some equation I wrote, but let's forget for a moment. So you you so you have an addition on weak coupling. In other words, uh, so you have an addition. So the the, the the theory at the chemical potential scale mu breaks down. But it breaks down in a regime where it still looks weakly coupled. Um, I don't see principle why this should happen. Why, 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 why there should be any problem in doing this? In this mm -hmm. uh, I see. Yeah. I, I, but, so then, but again, I'm not sure I have a definite answer. I haven't thought about that yet. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. You don't see, I mean, finite and large n, yes. But then you say, if I take a really large n, you're saying. Then I would have to do, mm -hmm. there are loops, that, that there are uh, further loops in one over n, right? That, uh, right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, as long as I zoom on the behavior on the charge, OK? See, uh, I, I, the, the large n expansion will, will allow me a, a, a one, an expansion power of 1 over n of the coefficient of the q to the 3 half, q to the 1 half, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm computing an expansion of this coefficient using the large n expansion, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, yeah. in principle, uh, I, you're saying that if I take send n to infinity to be bigger than well, I don't know. I'm, I'm just asking because because there's there's a possibility of checking this number, for instance, and uh, if we have uh, QED uh, or not not QED the CPN model in two plus one dimensions, and we look at monopole operators of large charge, those can be studied in the large N expansion, so. Okay, let me think about it. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, yeah. There, there is something okay. that, and I'm now looking at my equation, I'm confused by something. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a, I have a, okay, um, are, are there any other questions, if other people want to ask questions? Well, if not, then thank you, Ricardo, for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah. Okay. And. Uh, yeah.